I am really excited to welcome back to Sunny in Seattle, Stephanie Banks. And I was just thinking as I was doing this outline, um, you know, uh, Stephanie, I'll just bring you on and then I'll ring, I'll, I'll read your bio. Um, but I, I have in my outline for the last several shows, you know, Stephanie Banks, formerly Stephanie Levinston. And I thought, I think we're at the point now where or we just say Stephanie Banks. Like, I feel like Yay! the transition is complete. What do you think? <laughs> oh, it's so complete, my friend. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank you, Benny. Well, awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> leave it to Benny. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm so glad to have you back. So we have today with us Stephanie Banks. And so I'll just read, I think many people uh, who listen to the show know you, but if we have any newbies out there or just for the sake of sharing your bio because you have an impressive, fun bio. So um, Stephanie Banks, uh, after serving in the healthcare industry as a hospital-based speech language pathologist for 20 years, realized that her intuitive gifts were calling loudly to her. So she left the medical setting to pursue her soul's work as an intuitive channel and spiritual guide and coach and has not looked back. Stephanie serves clients around the globe who are seeking ways to expand their own intuitive gifts and of wisdom. She serves those who are seeking connections with loved ones and ancestors on the other side of the veil, as well as those who are seeking clarity in their career, professional life, relationships, life transitions, and many other areas in which life may have become confusing, chaotic, and uncertain. Her gifts allow her to connect with a client's higher self, other souls on the planet, souls on the other side, guides, animals, even the trees in Gaia. Um, she trained under the mentorship of Sally Baldwin and Sonia Choquette, and she is a favorite intuitive of Lynn Twist, who most uh, know from her book, The Soul of Money. Um, her website is soulinsight.com. That is soulinsight.com. Um, did I miss anything, Stephanie? You covered it, Sunny. Thank you so much for having me back. I love doing this show with you. Oh, I always look forward to it. And I was having so much fun preparing my outline today. Um, but we have a couple of things that might, they absolutely um, dovetail beautifully with soul insight and intuition and spirit guidance and all of the things. But they're also really interesting aspects of your life that I feel like not everybody may know about. I mean, I know we've talked about them, but it's been several years now, I think. And so I'm excited to talk today um, about a couple of things that are um, meaningful aspects to your life. Um, and I think you said uh, you are always so generous with your time and your gifts, but that you might be willing to take some callers in the second portion of the show. Yeah, that would be fun. Okay, awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and just give the number out. No, um, we're we're not going to open the phone lines yet. Um, we'll announce the official opening of those phone lines um, for when we're ready to take callers. But I just want to give the number out now. So in case you know you want to call in for a reading later in the show, you will have that number at the ready and you can get in the queue. Um, that number is 888-298-5569. That's 888-298-5569. And um, we will open those phone lines probably in the second half of the show. But before then, we've got a couple of interesting topics to cover. Um, so I don't know, Stephanie, you know, we've given, I know you shared your background um, on the show before, but is there anything you want to touch on that's not in your bio that, you know, just to give people a feel for who you are? Or are you kind of like, oh, I've been on the show enough. Like, I don't need to talk about all that anymore. You know? Yeah. <laughs> no, let's dive into your, you know, what we talked about talking about, because I know we've got some beautiful things to discuss. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Okay. So I got your newsletter this week, and it's, as I was mentioning before we went live, it's always interesting. You always seem to send a newsletter before we have a show scheduled that is like such a beautiful, timely topic. Um, and I'm really curious about this because as I mentioned in your bio, you spent several decades or at least two decades as a licensed certified speech language pathologist. And, and these are things I didn't know about you. You, in, in that work, you were in every type of setting from like schools, hospitals, nursing homes, rehab centers. You've worked in the neonatal intensive care unit, which I know is very high pressure, um, pediatric intensive care, neuro intensive care units, um, as well as on um, uh, traumatic brain injury, infant feeding, excuse me, and stroke teams, um, even becoming the supervisor of an entire speech therapy department. I did not realize how um, 
how you had used that particular licensure. But your newsletter said this week that you, after uh, many years of, of sitting with the decision, let the license lapse. And I'm curious, how did you decide to do that or why? Um, uh, it just, I, I, I'm saying this also because I'm selfishly interested. I have maintained my law license in Texas. It's an active status. I don't practice or um, I'm not in a level of licensure current with my continuing education, but it, it, the license is for all intents and purposes still active. I could go back with certain hoops jump thrown, jump through um, to, to practice again, but I don't. I just keep the license kind of active in the background. Um, so I don't know if and when I'll ever let that go. So I was really intrigued by your decision to let that uh, speech language pathology license lapse. Oh, yeah. And hearing you say it out loud on the radio waves, I'm like, oh, gosh, did I really do that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I guess I did. Um, so clearly, I'm still in that stage of I, I know it was the right choice for me. And I'll tell you what went into making that decision. Um, but I still have a body response to it, like a little bit of a tightening of was that is that OK? Mm. And yes, it's OK. And I did sit with it for a while. So for me, I knew that I was not, I did not have any intention or desire to return to the work of being a speech pathologist. Um, and that's not because I didn't love it. I loved it. I loved all the settings I worked in. I loved all the patients I worked with and their families. I, I feel like I had a tremendously positive impact and was beautifully um, impacted by those that I, that I served, witnessing their healing and their transformations and their rehabilitation. Um, from newborn babies to I've had 108 year old, you know, um, wow. elders on my caseload as well. So really, I, I made sure with my profession as a speech pathologist to go everywhere and do everything because I wanted the full flavor. I didn't want to complete a career and say, gosh, I wish I, I knew what it was like to work in the schools, or I wish I knew what it was work to you know, what it was like to work in a neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit. So I did it all. Um, and then for the last few years, when I have last five years, maybe when I've really been focused only on my channeling work, the, the, you know, the yearly reminders is time to pay for this, you know, renewal. It's time to get your endless continuing education hours done. It's time to do this and that I would jump through those hoops, but they, took a lot of time and I was less and less and less interested and inspired. There were no courses I really wanted to take anymore. I felt like I could teach half of them, not from an <laughs> ego place, but just yeah. once you work for that long, you know, it's not, uh, there's not a whole lot of new information anymore. Yeah. Um, and so I just found, you know, I, I set myself up on my computer for these continuing education and multitask as many do. I'm not revealing anything that most people don't do when they do their continuing education online um, and complete that. But it felt, it started to feel like a drain and it started to feel weighty and heavy and annoying to me where I would dread these reminders. And I just sat with it, I converse with my guidance around it. Um, I looked at what are any possible scenarios where I would, where I would return to that clinical work. Mm -hmm. And the only scenario I could come up with is if I could no longer do my intuitive work, then I, that would be my fallback. But mm -hmm. the things that would make it possible or the things that would make it impossible for me to do my intuitive work would also make it impossible for me to do my speech work. Like, wow. God forbid, I lose my voice, you know, or I can't communicate or something of that nature. Um, I wouldn't be able to do speech then anyways. So I knew that it doesn't really have a place for me anymore. I feel I felt complete with it and very joyful about it and, and fulfilled by it. So I, I let it go. I just did not renew this year. And I sort of felt like the entire month of December, when you get bombarded with those um, reminders, I was <laughs> holding my breath, like, okay, just hold steady, girl, hold steady. You can do this. Okay. Just <laughs> let it, let it go. Don't respond. Don't click, you know, <laughs> don't click on that. It's okay. Don't pay for that. You can do this. And now <laughs> It's done and I feel free. Oh, I love that because I know you cannot be the only person out there who has been sitting with 
Do I let it go? Do I not? Is this complete? How much is the energy drain affecting me? So I'm hoping that that is inspiring for someone out there listening who is afraid to let something go, but that knows that it's probably time. And I'm just curious, I know, you know, you said you kind of had to make it through the barrage of the messages. Are you sure? Are you sure? But now that you have let it go, what's the, what's your feeling state around it? Well, I, in my world, the universe always shows up to affirm something. Mm. So, um, (laughs) so I've got a a lot of new clients now. (gasps) Yeah. (laughs) So it's just, um, that's kind of my, my joyful signal from guidance that, yeah, this is, we are, we are meant to grow here. I am meant to really focus on serving more, um, individuals in this way in, in the way that fulfills me now and the way that inspires me now. Yeah. I've got new courses I'm offering. I've got a lot of people who I'm teaching channeling to, who I'm literally seeing them blossom and, and take their skills to levels that are astonishing even themselves. So yeah. I, I know this is this is the call for me at the moment. And so there there's no missing of anything. Um, I don't there's nothing to miss. It's just, it's just moving forward. Yes. And I know some of the people that are in this particular program or one of the one or two of the classes you're talking about, and they are loving it. It is a Mm. highlight of their week. And I know that they have experienced uh, incredible growth in terms of their ability to um, connect intuitively and access that guidance. So anywho, I can vouch for that. Um, (laughs) And I don't, it's not lost on me, Stephanie, that you were in a clinical setting um, of working with people on communicating and, and then really your current work is about communication as well. Yeah. Um, so really it's just one type of communication to another. I don't know if you, if you see those two as related at all, but I thought that was interesting. Totally related, excitingly related. Yeah. It's, um, it's miraculous to me, like how, how linked everything is. And I've done so many different things professionally in my life and they've all have felt very linked, Mm -hmm. but this one is just very obvious. It's another way to communicate and stay connected on other levels that go beyond the verbal communication or written communication. That was the sole focus of speech therapy work. Yes. And that is like the perfect segue that you just like put out there on a gold platter for where we're (laughs) in our conversation next, because when we were approaching the show this week and I, I was, um, I have, um, someone in my world who has a loved one who was recently diagnosed with a memory disorder. And this person was expressing that, you know, they got the diagnosis, but they didn't get any type of, um, resource. They weren't given like a pamphlet or some documents that would give them resources, you know, what kind of legal, legal documents do you need to get in place? What's the next step as the disease starts to progress? I mean, completely in the dark about how to navigate going forward with this diagnosis with their loved one. And I thought, you know what? Stephanie Banks wrote a book about this, uh, Joining Joni, which was about your own journey with your mother and her memory disorder, all the way from diagnosis through the hospice care and ultimately her transition. Um, and so I pulled that book out and was reminded because I was more focused on the story part when I read it the first time. And I will just say that not only is the story compelling, but that you provide in that book. And I'm saying this for anyone out there because I gave this book to this person in my life. Um, but that this book is also a step-by-step guide of practical advice and wisdom for how to go from diagnosis all the way to transition with someone with a memory disorder. And so um, I mentioned that to you and you said, oh, I think this is, this is what we're supposed to talk about this week. The concept of finding alternative ways of communicating with others who have neuro deficits or differences. Um, and maybe we'll even talk about listeners connecting to a loved one um, through a a guided practice of some sort. So anyway, I was just very excited. So I don't know what you, uh, what you want to share about, um, you know, joining Joni, the book or your journey with your mom, Joni, um, when she had the the memory disorder diagnosis. 
Thank you. Thanks, Sunny. Thanks for just bringing the book back uh, off of my dusty shelf, actually. <laughs> because <laughs> It's been a while since I have referenced it. The book feels to me like it wrote itself. It kind of was a an offering to those who are walking the walk of loving someone with um, dementia or Alzheimer's or memory disorder or brain injury or neuro neurological or cognitive deficits. So, um, and it's, it's a big deal um, to get a diagnosis like that. And you're right, there's still very poor, unfortunately, follow up and follow through for resources. The resources are out there. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, there, there's a lot of groups. Um, for my mother, she had frontotemporal dementia, um, which is a very specific kind of dementia that affects people much younger. So she got her um, symptoms when she was in her 50s. Mm. So, um, and then her journey with dementia was like over 15 years long. Oh. So it was a, 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 a long journey, uh, extended journey. And so the resources are out there, but you have to kind of know where to look and it's hard to find that. So this book, I hope will support others in the very pragmatic ways of how they can do the, the simple things. There are very simple adjustments you can make to the way you interact with your loved one that will feel different because normally you're relying upon verbal communication. You are relying upon what they say to be what is accurate. And with a lot of types of dementia, that pathway in the brain is interrupted. You get plaques that are developing and pathways are breaking apart. And so they might say words that are not real words. They might pull together sentences that are real words, but make no sense. You might be left without content to work with. And so you have to pull in what the book it talks about a lot is how can you pull in more types of communication to make sense of. So we don't just have verbal, we have body language, we have facial expressions, we have eye contact, eye gaze, we have um, lots of, of things. We can we, we tune into each other's energy without even really knowing it. And we can use all of that to create a more cohesive understanding of what our loved one is trying to communicate because communication is for connection. And you don't want to lose your connection to your loved one. That is the most important piece throughout the entire journey you'll take with them mm -hmm. is how, what can I do to stay connected to this person? Which means that sometimes I might pretend that I understand what they're saying, um, even though I don't get all of it, but I can get the gist of it because it affirms their attempt to connect on a preserve the back and forth nature of communication. You say something or indicate something, I respond, then you do, then I do. There's a turn taking, there's reciprocity, there's validation. And those things can be preserved even when our loved one doesn't have the language skills they used to or is not using language anymore. Sometimes it affects, you know, they, they are nonverbal. They cannot communicate verbally at all anymore. And then we really have to dig in and try to stay connected in other ways. Yeah. And I'm, I'm reminded of um, uh, once when you visited Seattle and you did a group uh, class at East West Bookshop and you were doing readings in the audience. And um, there was a woman there who wanted to communicate with her son who is in currently living, um, you know, on earth right now mm -hmm. in a human body, um, not a transitioned loved one, I guess is the distinction I'm making. And he, um, was on the autism spectrum. He was pretty severe case. He was nonverbal and you were able to communicate with him. And it was one of the most, I've seen you work a lot. Um, it was one of the most moving readings that I have witnessed that you have done um, because the, it just, it opened up for that mom, um, messages and, and that if I remember correctly, like what you communicated, like the, the little boy was like, I promise this is part of my path. I'm good. There's nothing you need to do that you aren't already doing. You've been a, an amazing mom and the things that, and they were very, you're always, you know, you're evidentiary when you do this. So you're giving her validation that this, the things, the messages that were coming through were very specific to her and her son. And it was, there was so much relief there. Anyway, it was such a beautiful thing to witness. And I'm, I'm wondering 
well, not only, you know, about that particular reading, but when your mom was going through this, I'm just realizing, I don't know how far along in your intuitive development uh, you were at that time. Were you using some of the things that you now do through your intuitive channeling to communicate with your mom? Or was that too early in your process? It was actually right at the beginning. It was timed perfectly. No, no big surprise there. Um, through, through the need to stay connected to her, I had to kind of rapidly develop my, and, and trust my intuition and our heart connection and our soul's communication. So it was happening all at the same time that I was uh, meeting this new friend who was a professional channel and then hosting circles of women with um, her channeling messages for everybody and having her, having my friend at that time channel my mom for me to give me additional information and foundation to work with um, so that I could carry forward um, our continued connection with each other. So it was all, all combined, really, all, all timed very, very closely together. Um, but it really did, I feel like my mom's, the, the need for that, to use that with my mom, really catapulted me into the intuitive work. I'm very grateful for that reason for it. And um, yes, I, I remember that reading. I've done a number of readings for, for just that. In fact, someone who took a, a channeling masterclass from me actually joined because she has a grandchild who is maybe three or four who is um, was nonverbal or is nonverbal and she was wanting to be able to connect with him more deeply at the soul level and really know mm-hmm. what she can do for him and and learned learned how to do that and their relationship is more easeful and and beautiful and joyful because of it. So this this is something that we can all do with practice. It's not just that certain people with certain gifts can can do that. You are the one that knows your loved one the best. So trust trust yourself and keep trying. It's kind of like when we go to another country and we attempt to speak the language, many people there, locals are just so happy we're trying. that they will give us more time, you know, and kind of bend over backwards to like, okay, you really butchered that word, but I get what you mean. And so we're going to, I'm going to help you out here. Here's the, you know, item you're looking for. Um, And it's the same with our loved ones. They, they know that we're trying, they know that we're present. They know that we're doing our best. Um, And even though there might be frustration on both sides of the picture um there's the the connection that matters and the love that matters so we'll, we'll stick it through they'll they'll wait they'll they'll be patient as patient as they can while we try to pull the communication more holistically together yes well if, if someone of course you've got your classes that are available in sessions etc but if someone is not utilizing that they're just kind of on their own with a loved one what kind of practice or uh wisdom do you have for them on how to kind of uh, start that connection or deepen that connection? Great question. If you get a new diagnosis like that, um, first off, give yourself time to let that settle because it is overwhelming and you may be inclined to sort of attack everything with resources and research. And that's not a bad thing. It's just that that can add even more confusion and chaos. So I, I recommend in every way across the board with every issue, slow down. Just, just be, be in stillness, connect um, quietly, literally through silence to your loved one. And you can ask certain questions through the heart, like, um, what do you need from me? How can I best support you? Mm. What is my role here? And how is it different? Or how is it the same? And then give space to what you receive in response. Um, This is going to come from spirit. It's going to come from your intuition. It's going to come from your guidance and from love. So write write down, get into a flow if you can of what comes through and, and trust that. And know that you you can do this and you're not meant, you can't do it all, all at once. Nobody does, but it's a journey and you are, there are stages to it just like anything else. And you won't be given more than what you can handle, even though at times it may feel like that. And your option to hit the pause button and slow down and really get a more wide angle view of what's important and what your, your purpose is with this journey um, is that's the important piece. 
so you can you can connect um, in that place of stillness and that quietness it doesn't have to be asking these questions of your loved one they are going to be overwhelmed too if they, first of all they may not even understand the diagnosis depending on where they're at with their cognition mm -hmm. um, sometimes in the case of my mom we didn't tell her about the diagnosis um, sometimes it's the kindest thing to do not to mm. because where she was in her journey she would have um, ruminated about that would have brought up so much fear so much she was there for her evaluations um, and she was there for feedback sessions but as soon as she left she forgot forgot the whole experience and that can be a blessing sometimes huh. instead of reliving the fact that I am losing my mind my memory my abilities I'll become dependent you know all the things that would go on who with someone who has a, an understanding of what's happening to them so it's a personal decision and that's one we did not take lightly to not remind her or not reorient her to what her diagnosis was and I'm very glad we did that because I feel like it allowed her to um, experience even more ease and love mm. so how did that work when she would have I assume episodes where things would be very confusing to her and when she would perhaps come back to a more clear focus was it kind of a back and forth for a period of time yeah it, it sometimes it was but it was always still very progressive still moving in the direction of losing more and more so sometimes i messed up <laughs> and i said the wrong thing and had to pay the consequences of that for a while because you know the repetition of someone who has dementia can be um excessive um and other times i just I, I hit it right. I said the right thing. A, a lot of it was me distracting her. Mm. So if she would say, oh, I just asked you that, didn't I? Or why am I repeating this? I would just say, oh, no worries. I do that too. Hey, why don't we go for a walk? Mm. Or, oh, look what your granddaughter just brought you. You know, it's something just to take the mind to a different place, to a mm -hmm. different state. That works really well a lot of times for people with dementia or cognitive issues mm. and is, is much more fun than belaboring anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you say, that's a very personal decision. And I, I would assume it's, it's, you know, situation specific, depending on what the circumstances are. And that was the best decision for your family yeah. um, and your mom um, for using that transition all, or the progression of the disease. Um, well, I, what do you think, Stephanie, should we give out the number and open the phone lines or you want to keep sure. talking a little more? Or? Either okay. is fine. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, then we'll go ahead. We'll give out the number another time. Um, we will open up those phone lines and see if we get some folks who want some reading. So Stephanie, as I'm, I will give out the number now and then maybe I'll throw it to you to say, what are they, what are we doing when they call okay. us for folks who don't know your work? <laughs> um, the number is 888-298-5569. That is 888-298-5569. Um, so yeah, feel free to call in and then Stephanie, what, what, what will they be getting if they call in? Well, today, Sonny, they will be receiving. <laughs> that really did sound game show, didn't it? <laughs> a washer dryer. Um, so what... <laughs> we're not offering a washer dryer. We'll just go ahead for legal disclaimer here. Darn it! I was going to call right. in. I need a new one. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> So what I will do for, for callers that we are able to take is I will listen to what your question is, what if there's something that's sitting on your heart that you would like to ask about, that you would like some higher level guidance around. You ask me, you let me know a little bit about what's going on, and then I tune into your message, and it might be your higher self that I tune into, which is your own soul. It might be a soul that's here on the planet with you right now that we bring the message from. It might be an ancestor or loved one on the other side, which is called mediumship. And I also do that work. Um, we, can, we can go in any direction. So if you have something or someone that you would like to connect with or receive insight or guidance from, then you have the opportunity to ask for that and receive that. Beautiful. Um, and then I also, you know, while we're waiting for folks to kind of uh, get on the queue, get in the queue, um, I wanted to ask you about, um, this was from a newsletter that you wrote 
wrote, um, this was actually right before our last show and it was right around your mom's birthday. Um, of course she transitioned in 2013. Um, but you wrote something and I just am curious to hear, um, you said, um, that my relationship with my mother was complex and complicated. Her journey with dementia made our connection even more challenging. I did a lot of healing and forgiving during those last few years of her life so that I could be more present and supportive to her and my father. Once she passed, I committed myself to even more healing and forgiveness. It's an ongoing process. And I'm just curious, one final question. I know we've already got people, uh, looks like in a queue, um, but that it, what, what did change in terms of your relationship with your mother when she did transition? Mm. Well, wow, everything opened up once she transitioned. So all the really? things that, yeah, all the things that I had been holding on to over the course of our relationship in, in body, like disappointments or, you know, feelings of wrongdoing or even regrets that I had of things that I had said or done or not said or not done um, during the time we had together. Um, just, it really just kind of released. Mm -hmm. um, I felt her with me immediately. In fact, no lie, for the first year after my mother passed, she sent a red cardinal um, to my son's window literally every day. I have no bird feeders on that window. Um, there's nothing to attract a bird. It would come and sit and look into the room every day. Mm. And I could tell it was there. I would hear the little, you know, claws scratching on the windowsill. And I'd be like, Hey, Joni, she loved Cardinals. She mm. loved brightly colored birds. Um, and I've seen, there've just been signs all over the place from her. So, and, and it really softened my heart to go through that. Luckily for us, she did have a peaceful transition. Um, and that was my one prayer towards the end. It had been so tumultuous and so many challenges um, that I just wanted her to be able to let go and ease. And she was with myself and my father there in her home, which she loved. And so um, there were so many gifts in that as well, but it, it really, she's, she's a huge support to me from the other side. She gets a kick out of everything I do. I can hear her laughing. Um, <laughs> she enjoys her grandchildren so much. She, she brags to all the spirit beings. I can hear her doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's been beautiful. Oh, I love that. I, you're not the first person, um, whether on the show or through reading um, other people's stories who have said that once the loved one transitioned, um, the relationship deepened or got closer in, in really beautiful ways. So I think in our culture, so often we see death as the end and, and it and actually can be just that a transition, not a, yeah. not necessarily an ending or a, yeah. And I don't mean to discount, you know, how much we miss the person in human form. Um, but there is the possibility, like you were saying for it to open up and to change in really, really lovely ways. Um, mm -hmm. so we do have, um, we'll go ahead and take our first caller. Um, before we do that, I will give out the number. The lines are still open 888-298-5569. That's 888 888- 298-5569. And we'll go ahead and welcome on Eugenia from Bothell. Eugenia, welcome to Sunny in Seattle. How can we help you? Thank you so much. Thanks for taking my call. Um, well, and that was a great story about your mom. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I wanted to know about, speaking of transitions, my transition from regular job um, for the last seven years in the next, say, four years transitioning to purpose, um, retirement, if you get anything about that. Ooh, I like those two words together. Purpose, retirement. Ooh. Yeah, good, good. Thank Excellent. You. Okay, Eugenia, let's tune into that. Let me, let me tune into your higher self for that one and we'll bring the message for you. The first thing that I would like to very much to acknowledge is that I have been purposeful this whole darn time and even prior to this lifetime as well. I'm always purposeful. Sometimes I forget about that. Sometimes I forget the importance of reminding myself about that and looking for the purpose in the most mundane of things that I do. And so here I am um, claiming that for myself again, for this isn't just a phase of life that I am um, exiting or entering into. It is a continuation of my purpose. 
And so the best thing for me to do right now is to get clear on what makes my heart sing because she wants to sing. She wants to get out there with her megaphone, in fact, and sing to the masses. She wants to be not, not just backup singer on a stage with the most talented of musicians, but really out front um, in, in the in the very uh, center stage, letting, letting herself belt out what is most joyous. And so while this is not so much literally about singing, it is about accessing that place that, that floats me high. And that brings me into coherence with what I know to be true of why I am here, which is not simply to be in service to others. Yes, I love that, but to be in service of that, which feels so grand and beautiful and delicious and spacious and succulent. Yes, that's it. That's me. That's my purpose. Oh, wow. Thank you. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, that was, uh, that feels really good. I, um, I love the part about, you know, what you said about just always being on purpose, right? Like thinking that what, what I'm doing now is not so important, but in fact, it actually is. It is. And this is a pitfall that so all of us, I would venture to say, make. We think one, you know, we call it a job, right? It's like a bad word almost. This is my job. Well, actually, no, this is where I go to serve others with what is needed right now. And to offer more of my spirit, more of myself, more of my attention, more of my affection, more of my intellect, Um, that's very purposeful. And so when you enter into retirement, um, which is also an interesting word because in our culture, we have a, you know, we have a particular definition of that. And I'm going to invite you to open that way up um, because it's, it's just another way to experience the beauty and love and light that is you and to also share it. So, um, yeah, very exciting and very beautiful and honor the ways in which you are already living into your purpose because they are many. Mm. Well, thanks again. That is a great way to start my day. I so appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for calling. Thank you, Eugenia. Um, um, Yeah. So before we take our next caller, I'll give out that number one more time in case you want to get in the queue. And that is 888-298-5569. That is 888- Two nine eight five five six nine. Um, yeah, and just real quickly before we bring on our next caller, I this is one of the things that I always point out, and one of the reasons I love your work, uh, Stephanie, is um, you will deliver the message, but you also help people process it. You know, depending on what appears to you, in addition to the words, you know, images in your mind or feelings that you get or things that came through, and help people actually take that and and apply it in their lives. So it's a very a practical intuition, if you will. Thank you. And also it's relevant to all, there's a universality to the messages as you heard with Eugenia's. Um, This is for all of us. If we really listen and let the message land for us as well, um, me too, right? Like I can look for more ways in my life that I'm actually doing very purposeful, meaningful work while I'm doing the dishes wow, that's interesting. (laughs) Laundry, you know, like from the most mundane, like her higher self said. So yeah, where can we elevate here? Oh yeah, that's beautiful. And I loved how you define job. I was just having a conversation about job versus career versus work versus, you know, whatever else Mm. you want to call it. Um, And and the way that you just described job was such a beautiful reframe, um, you know, for giving it a different positive meaning than what we, I think, like you said, culturally associate with it but yeah it's kind um, of a dry okay. crusty so word isn't another it? caller oh oh sorry. sorry i i think i broke up for a moment my bad stephanie what were you saying i was just acknowledging that job is such a dry crusty word i don't even like it okay go ahead next caller <laughs> okay <I'm> sorry <laughs> Okay, so we have a Bill calling in from Seattle. Bill, welcome to Sunny in Seattle. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, my question is, I have a brother that passed about a month ago, and has he made a full transition and possibly general reading too? Bill, say the second part again, if you could, because the sound quality um, wasn't quite what I could hear. You, you have a brother that transitioned a month ago, and what was the second part? And possibly, if I could have a general reading as well. 
Okay, well, we can tune in for time's sake. We can tune into um, either you, your higher self, if you wish, or your brother. Um, do you? Would you like to choose one? Uh, yeah, my brother. <clears throat> okay, got it. And do you have a question on your heart that you would like him to speak to? Uh, yes, has he made a full transition? Or... Okay, how his how his transition was for him. Pardon me? How, how his transition was for him, you're asking? Right. If he, he, a complete yes. transition the way okay. A complete transplant. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Complete. Gotcha. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. I will be very, very brief here for it is, it is busy for me in the most lovely of ways. Very difficult to explain. I'll, I'll find the words for it another time. Very soon, very soon, I promise. But in the meantime, be, be on the lookout for me for I am still all around. And yes, I am still fully ensconced in what you call the purest of love. So I am here now to be in reflection. I am here now to be of service eventually. For now, however, I am looking deeply and clearly and fully into the magic that was here for me for the many ways that you have um, loved me i am eternally grateful and for all of the ways that i have uh, fallen short well i have only love to be in reflection of that and so know that i am held very warmly here i am supported i am given a a set of binoculars if you will so i can see from far far off very very clearly up close and it is helping me to form a more perfect way of understanding Understanding my perfection. Thank you so very much for your uh, for your loving kindness. I am here, as I say, fully and completely in the love. Okay, thank you very much. Thank You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, so, Stephanie, I do have a question, um, and I'll get. Let me give out the number one more time because we still do have availability if anyone would like a reading, um, and that is eight 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 two nine eight. 5569. That's 888-298-5569. Um, so I have heard, um, and I know everybody's intuitive connection is different um, in terms of those who are practicing intuitives, mediums, um, or otherwise, that you know, I guess everyone's connection is different. Everyone tunes in and, and I guess how you practice your craft, um, it, it kind of depends on your own unique composition of your being. But I've heard some mediums say that they have, you can't always connect with someone um, for a variety of reasons. Like say you want to talk to, like Bill wanted to speak to his brother. Um, I've heard some mediums say it's not always up to us, but I've always noticed your ability to tune in is very clear. So how does that work or for you particularly, how is it that you were able to tune in? Yes. So, wow, there are times, they're rare, but there have been times when I will tune into a particular soul and I receive information um, that that's not who I will be hearing from, but they send a guide in their place. And so the, the message or communication that would normally be transmitted through the particular soul is now just being transmitted through another vessel, say a, a spirit guide of some sort, um, which is perfectly fine with me. And then I've, I just let the client know, well, we're, so we're not going to hear from this one on that, but it, there is a guide here on their behalf and they will bring the response to the question or wondering that you have. Um, there's, you know, I've read, there's so many different schools of thought about time frames when someone transitions to the other side. Is there yeah. a specific amount of time in which we should, should or shouldn't? Um, invite their energy in to channel. And what I have found is that it varies with every practitioner. For me, I just, I, I open, I ask, I listen, and I accept whatever is mm. there. So if it, um, if it's a being that's recently transitioned and they don't, they're not ready or they don't want to come through again, I will get a guide on their behalf. Um, and, or if like in, in Bill's brother's case, he kind of spun in a little bit is how I felt. I'm like, Oh, okay, here we go. 
I will, you know, I'm really happy to, you know, thank you for giving me some airspace here and, and yeah, I'm good. And I'm really in the, in the business right now of being loved so much and reflecting and understanding and forgiving. Like I felt a lot of self-forgiveness for him as, as a soul, like towards himself, like looking at, I think he said his shortcomings and coming to an understanding of the fact that he's, he's perfection, right? We are um, divine beings. So, um, so, so that can happen too, but I, I haven't found in my practice in the way that I work with spirit, that there is any hard and fast rule about don't channel this, you know, until a certain amount of time. What I recommend for those who are surviving, um, loved ones who have passed, uh, channel only when you feel ready because grief Mm. is intense and sometimes the messages as loving as they are can feel very disconcerting and sometimes even confusing when grief is so profound um so i do recommend waiting some time uh, after after a loss just to give yourself the space to use the message integrate it and feel ready for it yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you clarified that because that was one of the questions like as a part of my initial question was, you know, that time frame because I, I like you have I've heard different things, but, you know, um, I don't have the experience with it that you do. Um, mm-hmm. And I do hope Bill got to hear that follow up as well, because that was such I love always the different ways that the energy comes into you is, is um, it's always fun to hear. Um, and I will say also, you know, Rob, my um, ex-husband who I love dearly. Um, and he transitioned in 2018 and he has come forward at very, sometimes he's really close. And then I've felt recently, he's a little farther off doing other things in the universe. So I loved something that came through and bills reminded me of that anyway. So thank you for clarifying that Stephanie. Definitely. Yeah. Well, so, um, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll take, uh, we'll take one more caller here. Um, and we have, uh, Anna from Kirkland. Anna, welcome to Sunny in Seattle. How can we help you? Hi, thanks for taking my call. My, um, ah. father passed away in March and my mother recently moved into an assisted care facility and, um, is not doing really well. And I, I just wonder if there's anything that um, maybe we're not doing or something is just that that we can do that um, will help her be more cognizant and uh, feel better. Okay. When you say your mother's not doing well, do you mean emotionally or physically or like you said, co- cognition? Her, her Cognition mainly. Okay. Um, okay. A little bit of physical, but mainly it's, it's the cognition. Okay. And I I don't know if dad has any suggestions or what, but. Okay. All right. Let's, um, let me listen for a moment and see which one of them wishes to speak. All right. Well, we'll bring in, we'll bring in your dad to speak to, um, how to support your mom. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. First, I would like to say you are so very dependable, and I truly, truly have always appreciated that about you. Thank you for finding what I would call to be a quite magical and non-traditional way for us to be in conversation. Wow, that's what I would say to this. Wow. Anyways, getting on to the matter at hand, what I want you to know is that it's just really important to follow her lead. You know I have had to learn this myself. In fact, trial and error, trial and error, but do so. I highly recommend you just do so. Follow her lead. See see what it is that you can glean from what it is that is being said or even what it is that is not being said. You cannot stop anything or halt anything. You can only make... Um, statements of approval and uh, love and appreciation and those will go so far what I want you to know is that they go so far as to be repeated over and over in her mind state and therefore settle onto her heart in a way that feels just like a warm blanket of love and that is all we really want for her after all right to be in the warmth to be in the love to be in the approval of those around her so this is a difficult time let us just honor that this is a time of 
in, in uncertainty and insecurity. This is a time of unfamiliarity and, and untethering. And we are asking quite a bit of adjustment on her side of things. One cannot blame her to sort of check out over and over more frequently. In fact, that that is uh, a, a coping mechanism that I um, that I can see great value in. So I would give you um, I would give you permission to follow what you feel to be the best thing to do. Do not question yourself. That can be a very slippery slope. Just sh show up, listen fully, completely, deeply, and follow in accordance with what you sense she is needing. You can't go wrong with that. Thanks again so much for this opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome, Anna. That was beautiful. Um, so many levels of beautiful, Stephanie. Um, I know, it, I think Anna was pretty emotional. Is there anything else? Because I feel like that, that was another message that could be helpful to a number of people out there. Anything else you want to say about that particular message that came through? Because that was, it had a lot to unpack. Yeah, I, I would say, again, just um, use it for all of us. Use that wherever you can. Where can we follow someone else's lead? for once, especially mm -hmm. someone who is in, in need or in a different state or going through a, a rough spot or a rough time. Uh, oftentimes, especially in this culture right now, there's so much yelling, screaming, divisiveness, you know, battling. Uh, where can we go really soft and really open and really allowing? And that message that her dad said about the message of approval Wow, that really came through uh, my heart space. Where can we be more approving of ourselves, of our loved ones? Um, give give messages that uh, and communication that says you you are perfectly fine, just like this, just mm -hmm. as you are. I you know this is this is fine. That behavior it's okay. This way of thinking it's all right. I, I approve of you. I there's room for you here. There's space for you here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing that stood out to me when he said, you know, um, that, that, that checking out is a coping mm. mechanism and that's not a bad thing. So I think yeah. from our perspective, often, if we see a loved one checking out, it's incredibly painful, but from the other side, I'm not just the other side of the veil, but from the individual who is checking out, perhaps that is just a coping mechanism and that is okay. Yes. And what I will say about checking out too, that we don't always know is that, um, they, it doesn't mean where they're just leaving what's going on in the physical right here. They're actually oftentimes going somewhere a whole lot more fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so let them, you know, don't, don't be so quick to like redirect your loved one back into what is or reality. Why? Yeah enough yeah. with reality. Let yeah. them, you know, be, let them travel, let them, let them yeah, experience. Let them yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to bring the show to a close because we're right at about time. Um, I have had the pleasure of welcoming back to Sunny in Seattle, uh, favorite intuitive channel, Stephanie Bank.